Good morning, big girls. Today we're talking about bust-proof players, guys that simply won't let you down, like Oreo Cakesters. You know, you know what you're getting. You know what you're getting with them. They might not have the highest ceiling, but you know when you click the draft button on them in round five, six, seven, eight, whatever, they're going to be a staple of your lineup. They're going to continue to feed the points that they're supposed to feed your lineup. Okay, so we've got five guys that I feel good that will not bust a 100% guaranteed lock rate or your money back. Let's turn the lights on, eh? It's showbiz, baby. Let's get it. Now, the first guy up on this list is, is someone that I've, like, learned to dislike for whatever reason. Loved him loved him coming out of college uh, because of what I thought he could become. And then he's like kind of become the exact player I thought he would be. And that's and that's Rashad White, the running back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All right. And I think the Bucs are well aware of what they have in Rashad White at this point. And it is an inefficient in between the tackles runner who is great in the passing game. Actually, I don't even know if I could say that because like if the Bucks knew that, that they would probably have moved differently. But since they didn't move differently, this is why I feel like his floor is so safe. And just a, a quick caveat here. Uh, these are my bus proof players. But in our draft guide, which is now available for pre-order, the cheapest way to get it is by signing up on Underdog Fantasy, depositing $10 with code BDGE, and you get free access to the draft guide for the entire summer. Updated rankings, all the good shit in there, uh, all of my complete fade players. So we talk talk about dudes that are bus proof. Let's talk about all the dudes that are busting this year, and we do not want to take all right that is in the draft guide if you've already signed up for underdog or if you're in a state that doesn't allow it you can go to bdge.co and get it for the pre-order price right now but rashad white last year number five in yards per reception amongst running backs number one in catch rate number two in terms of the rate at which he was playing during two and four minute drills so he is the clear pass catcher here obviously the dude had nine red zone targets and only scored one touchdown the only other back in the nfl that had at least nine red zone targets and didn't score at least three receiving touchdowns was tony p so he probably should have had a lot more touchdowns in the receiving game same with the rushing game, all right? Because you look at his carry totals last year, 272. Derrick Henry was the only running back that had more carries in the NFL than Rashad White last year, and he only scored six rushing touchdowns. So I went back. I looked over like the last six years, okay? There's only been two times over the last six years in which a running back had 270 or more carries and scored six touchdowns, six or fewer rushing touchdowns. You have Zeke in 2018. He had six touchdowns on 304 carries. You know what happened the next year? He had 12 rushing touchdowns and two more through the air. The other instance was Joe Mixon in 2019, 278 carries, five rushing scores. The next year, 2019, he only ended up playing in six games before he got hurt, but he scored four times. So realistically, he was averaging out the double digit touchdowns. The next full year, he got healthy, 2020, 13 rushing touchdowns, three receiving touchdowns. Okay. So when you look at the touchdown unluckiness of Rashad White, he probably should have scored in like the 10 to 12 touchdown range based on the total volume that he got. And listen, I know he was kind of bad as a runner, but Tampa Bay's run blocking line ranked 29th in the NFL last year per PFF. They took Graham Barton with their first round pick this year. So that should at least help improve them slightly. And listen, there is a case that Rashad White is just kind of a bad running back outside of third downs, kind of like uh, the career path that Antonio Gibson went down and that they should scale his early down workload a, a bit. But guess what? Tampa Bay didn't go out and, and draft a Brian Robinson like Washington did to Antonio Gibson. So despite the hesitancy with Rashad White and his in-between the tackles efficiency, all they did was added a 5'9", 192-pound day three running back in Bucky Irving, who is 20 pounds lighter than Rashad White is, has a similar skill set in terms of like athleticism and pass catching department. And while White isn't like an elite pass blocker, he's middle of the pack. Bucky Irving's pass blocking grade last year was the single worst in the draft class that we gathered uh, numbers for in terms of draft prospects. So had they gone out and signed like a Zach Moss or, or like a Devin Singletary, maybe I'd be more worried about it. But even if Bucky Irving gets like a Jalen Warren role, which I think is asking a lot for a day three rookie coming in, 
Najee still gets nearly like 300 opportunities and has had eight touchdowns or more in all three seasons. So I think that's the floor of Rashad White right now. Like it might not be fun owning him, right? I don't know that he has a crazy amount of upside on a week to week basis, but if you're fading running back in the beginning rounds, like he's the perfect mid round guy to target. So going off of Rashad White in that same vein, someone I think I actually just fucking mentioned was Joe Mixon. All right. I think Damian Pierce is the clear two. And it's probably not even fair to call him like a clear two based on how the season ended last year. In my eyes, he's he's sort of like CEH in, in Kansas City to what Isaiah Pacheco is, where it's like they want to ride the one guy. But if he needs a break, if he needs to take a breath, if he gets hurt or something like that for a play, this guy's going to come in. All right. But they gave Joe Mixon a pretty sizable amount of money for a relatively long-term contract, especially given his age and the running back position. During his tenure in Cincinnati, he averaged over 20 opportunities per game. That's a seven-year span, and that is like unheard of volume over a span that long in today's game, right? They just wanted a back that they could trust, and they got him in Joe Mixon. This offense is going to be a juggernaut. They were 13th in scoring last year with Stroud as a rookie. Now they add Stephon Diggs. Now they add Joe Mixon. Now they're in the second year with C.J. Stroud and this offense. Like, they could probably be a top five, top six, top seven scoring offense, which is going to lead to a ton of goal line carries for Joe Mixon. I mean, last year, Devin Singletary, Damian Pierce, and Andrew Beck, their fullback, combined to see 21 goal line carries. They converted that into five rushing touchdowns. For context, Gus Edwards had 23 goal line carries. He scored 12 rushing touchdowns. Joe Mixon himself had 21 goal line carries, so he matched the Houston backs, and he scored seven times. Raheem Mostert had 20 goal line carries, 12 goal line touchdowns. Point is, if you're seeing 16, 18, 20 plus goal line carries, which I expect Joe Mixon to see in this offense, you're usually going to convert them into eight, nine, 10 plus rushing touchdowns. So the floor of the scoring offense is what makes me feel good about Mixon's fantasy floor, right? The upside is probably not in the passing game. I don't think that's really uh, CJ Stroud's game overall, dumping it to running backs, especially with all the good pass catching weapons out there. But I, I think it's the fact that he could end up, I don't want to say leading the league in rushing scores, but end up being top five or top three in rushing touchdowns this year. So I think you're getting a rushing touchdown out of Mixon at minimum every other game. All right, so we got Rashad White, we got Joe Mixon. We're swooping back up to the quarterback position. I've talked a lot about Dak, but I want to attack him from a little bit of a different point of view than I've, than I've uh, talked about so far in my videos, but Dak Prescott is number three on this list. I just don't see a world where he's not a high performing, high, high, high performing fantasy point per game guy for you. And I would argue that he has probably the highest ceiling of anyone on this list. He has finished with over 20 fantasy points per game at the QB position in four of the last five years. He now has an alpha, an elite wide receiver one. And the biggest thing about like the way that this Dallas offense is moving is when you look at how they started to move post buy last year, right? They had their buy in week seven. And this is the splits on the left side is post week seven. On the right side is before week seven. Okay. You could see the volume goes up. The efficiency goes up. Everything goes up. Like despite throwing the ball five more times per game after the buy, he threw fewer interceptions and averaged a full yard per attempt more. Now, those fantasy numbers on the splits are six point per passing touchdown. I don't know why Rotoviz automatically defaults to that, but even on that setting, that 26.8 fantasy points per game that you see up there in six point per passing touchdown was number one in fantasy football. So if he had done that over the course of the season, he would be the QB one. And those numbers don't even include that 400 yard three touchdown playoff game. All right. Dak was fucking dialed over the second half of last year. He is annually in the top five in terms of passing attempts per game. And I just don't see a, a world this year based on how that team is set up where he's not that again this year. And that's not even to mention on paper, he's got the third easiest strength of schedule in the fantasy playoffs. All right. And those are some things that you will find in our draft guide. We are creating the first ever tiebreaker matrix. The whole point of the draft guide this year is to solve the problem of when I'm on the clock, who should I be drafting? There's prep material in there like we've done in previous years, but the, the the overall North Star and the problem that we're trying to solve in the draft guide this year is like when those two minutes on the clock hit, I don't want to feel nervous. I want to feel prepared. So we are creating this tiebreaker metrics where you can go through our rankings and you get to Dak and there's a drop down where it compares him to the guys around him. And it's got things like fantasy playoff schedule. It's got things like the pace of the offense, the offensive pace, the offensive line ranking, things like that for each position. Very contextual and very easy to make decisions on the clock like that. So he has on paper the third easiest fantasy playoff schedule. Again, go cop the draft guide by downloading Underdog Fantasy, depositing 10 bucks or more using code BDGE. After Dak, guys that are a little bit less pricey, I think that entire tier of like Tua, Brock Purdy, Jared Goff are all 
phenomenal floor plays given the weapons around them. They all have elite weapons, Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddell, uh, Debo Ayuk, Kittle, C-Mac, uh, Jameer Gibbs, David Montgomery, Amon Ra, Sam Laporta. They all have pretty good offensive lines. Like Their floors, I think, are really, really, really high despite how you feel about them as quarterbacks. Now, let's move to the first wide receiver on this list, Christian Kirk, a guy that I've started to talk about a little bit more recently, obviously, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Number one wide receiver, Calvin Ridley is gone. 140 targets out the door. Obviously, Brian Thomas is in, Gabe Davis is in. But when I look at how I'm projecting Christian Kirk for this year, we got you know Underdog Fantasy in their Twitter account doing God's work over here. Right now, Christian Kirk is going off the board at wide receiver 30. His receiving yards projection is 25 yards lower than Brandon Ayuk, who is going off the board at wide receiver 12. Now, I got nothing against drafting Brandon Ayuk at wide receiver 12. I think, you know, coming off a 1,300-yard season for him to be at 950 feels a little bit low, but I think it's also just a little bit of disrespect to Christian Kirk. Now, Kirk was on pace for a career year last year, and he was the best wide receiver in that offense for sure before he was hurt. Like when you watch them play, it ran way more smoothly when he was on the field as compared to trying to run it through Calvin Ridley. And I think like, obviously he's coming off a serious injury, but he's already back at practice running in full. So I'm not worried about any sort of hangover from the injury. And while he's been around for a minute, the dude is only 27, which is still peak years for wide receivers. And I know a lot of people like Evan Ingram, Evan Ingram. When you look at this tweet though, like Evan Ingram, half PPR fantasy points per game with Christian Kirk, 7.7 without him, 15.2. Five, okay. When we talked to Trevor in Vegas, he kept gushing over how much he liked Kirk's speed, versatility, and reliability. All right. So Evan Ingram, a lot of his splits and volume came from the fact that Christian Kirk was gone. Christian Kirk was out. He was not on the field, which led to a lot of the over the middle targets that usually would have went to Kirk to go to Evan Ingram. So I think we'll see obviously Calvin Ridley gone, a lot of targets open up, but Evan Ingram's game probably takes a little bit of a, a, a step down. All right. And the other thing that I can't stop thinking about is like, what if Trevor Lawrence just finally takes the jump into superstardom, right? They added some pieces on onto the offensive line. Like it could happen. And Kirk will obviously be the biggest beneficiary of that jump. So for me, the floor comes down to the fact that these two have just phenomenal chemistry. We've already seen it. He plays in the slot. He's a very good player overall. So that just gets me, you know, gets gets my tits a little perked. And the last guy up on this list is Najee Harris. I won't waste a lot of time on this because I've talked about him a bunch already this offseason. I, I think we genuinely saw the worst case scenario for Najee Harris last year. They were a completely broken offense, uh, bottom five in scoring. Jalen Warren became a significant fucking factor in this backfield. He, he got nearly 225 opportunities last year, and Najee still found a way to have 300 opportunities, posted 1,200 yards from scrimmage, and scored eight touchdowns. Now they bring in three offensive linemen, in the draft, one being their first round pick. Now back to back years of first round offensive linemen. They bring in Russell Wilson, who will give this offense, I think, more stability. Plus they add Arthur Smith, whose offense is, you know, infamously and to a fault run through their running back. So again, last year I think we saw a worst case scenario from Najee and he you know, he didn't win you the league, but he was fine. He is a safe floor play who I think will actually have a better season this year than he did last year. He's playing for the contract too. So like, you know, I think he's got a little extra steam to him. They said he's lost some weight. I'm not really putting too much into that, but I think there's a lot of positive going for Najee to the fact that like where he's getting drafted is insane and the floor is just beautiful for him. And there's no tight ends on this list. Like I don't feel great about putting my stamps on any tight ends because like, yeah, sure. You could put Kelsey or Laporta. As you can see, I tried to stay away from anyone within like the first four rounds of drafts, realistically, uh, going off underdog ADP. Like if you look at Kelsey, Laporta, McBride, obviously those guys are going to be great for your fantasy lineups. But as soon as you get to like tight end six, Pitts is 1000% not bust proof. Uh, George Kittle is brittle. Evan Ingram went crazy last year, but only, as I said, with the splits before when Christian Kirk was gone. All right. So it, it's why I've been really, really adamant that like I'm not really looking for a floor play at tight end. I'm trying to be the last guy to draft in that top five tier of tight ends of Kelsey, Laporta, McBride, Kincaid, Mark Andrews. So that's what I'm looking for at tight end. And ultimately, people just underestimate the value of having safe players in the middle rounds of your draft. Like the first few rounds are for your fucking studs. And those are the guys that are going to score 60% of your fantasy points. And you can miss on your middle rounds and have your studs go like absolutely crazy. But for a truly like elite fantasy team, one that goes all the way, wins the championship, like your your team needs to hit on two to three extremely high ceiling studs. Uh, and then you need to pad the rest of your team with dudes that score 9, 11, 13, 14 fantasy points per game. Those are the unsung heroes, man. This year feels like 
the middle rounds are just jam packed with those types of dudes if you take the right type of players. All right. So those are my five favorite bus proof players of the 2024 fantasy football season. Let me know who you got down below. While you're down there, hit the button that looks like this. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're putting out videos like this four or five times a week. And of course, go cop the draft guide pre order available right now on bdge.co. Cheapest way to get it though is by depositing $10 or more on underdogfantasy.com using promo code BDGE. Not only are they going to hit you with that deposit match, but you'll get the draft guide for free. I love you. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and I'll see y'all tomorrow for, for Thirsty Thursday. Mwah.